each other. It's time to stay awake Watching o'er the sea For we don't know what lies ahead Tempest or storm My duty is to warn For safety for the lives of men Watching through the darkest night Watching for the crewmen's lies Standing ready and more sure With God's help I will endure Holding fast the steady course With our captain forevermore With open eyes and heart Ready to sound alarm For approaching friend or foe The lighthouse is our guide As we watch through weary eyes Across the waves of Beam Hill Sand Watching through the darkest nights watching for the crewmen's lives standing ready and more sure with God's help I will endure holding fast the steady course with our captain forevermore I can't do it on my not alone my God will strengthen me open eyes and heart ready to sound alarm for approaching friend or foe watching through the darkest night watching for the crewmen's lives standing ready and more sure with God's help I will endure watching through the darkest nights watching for the crewmen's lives holding fast the steady course with our captain once more Watching with our captain forevermore. Good morning. I'd like you to take your Bibles this morning and go to the book of Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Chapter 25. Man is always trying to remake himself. He's trying to implement different plans different ideas, different formulas, different methods on how to make the world better, how to accomplish all of the problems, uh, solutions to all of the problems that we are faced with. And one of the things that was introduced several administrations ago was something called leading from behind and uh, some of that theory is the, the use of diplomacy and this that and, that and the other thing and turning a um, blind eye to some of the atrocities that are things are happening around the world and uh, they want to establish a peace from this but it's really just ignoring a lot of things and submitting to things that God's Word says we shouldn't submit to. In the book Numbers, 
chapter 25, there's a record talking about the children of Israel and how the children of Israel got involved with things they shouldn't have gotten involved with. They got involved with the things of the world, things of other nations. And then they started to fellowship in those particular things, and it caused them nothing but trouble. God's word was very clear about what God wants from his people and what God expects from his people. God's word also said, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey and a curse if you disobey. So they knew the consequences. But the world is very alluring and peer pressure and the senses can deceive and can pressure you into doing things that you normally wouldn't do. That's why I continually warn you against the world, the things of the world and the news and the things that the world promote. And the simple knowledge that Satan is the god of this world should give you ample proof that you don't want any things, anything to do with what he promotes in the world. In Numbers 25, Israel was in a holding pattern. In beginning in verse 1, it says they abode in Shittim. And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. They were staying put. The surrounding area was full of garbage. They got sucked into it. It looked good. And so they started to do what those people were doing. That's why, for myself, I do not go places and do things that will tempt me to blow fellowship with God. I don't want to become a Samson and see how strong I am. I don't need the opportunity to sin, so I just simply stay away from it. They didn't. They called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. The people did eat, and they bowed down to their what? Right. You know what one of the commandments was? Don't have any other gods before me, right? So they knew this. So this is willful sin, it's not something that you didn't know. It's something that you knew, but hey, everybody else is doing it. It's a party that's bow when they bow. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Baal Peor is a compound word. Baal is a general word used in the Old Testament, means Lord. Peor was speaking about a raised place. It was a mount, okay? Some, like a hill where they would go and they would meet. The real name of the idol of the Moabites, of Moab, was Chemosh, okay? That was the name of the god that they were worshiping. And the way that they would worship... Chemosh was they would engage in orgies, a lot of lascivious acts, lascivious acts. And when Israel participated in this particular festival, they committed not only the sin of idolatry, but they committed a sin of wickedness. It was evil what they did. Well, verse 4, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, and Carmen was talking about standing up here teaching, you may not do this, you may not do that. And I thought to myself, it's not as all luxury, luxurious as you think, because this is where the bullets get fired at. So who God go to? Moses. <laughs> Moses mind his own business, perhaps having a cookie and a cup of tea. Hey, Moses. Oh, and I could just see him now. He's going like this. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. 
take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. You see this? They brought a plague unto themselves, and people were dying from the plague. And you got to read this, because this literally is telling Moses to kill the leadership, the, the subordinate officers, the leaders of tens, the leaders of fifties, the leaders of hundreds. In our day and time would be made perhaps a corporal or a general, perhaps a second lieutenant. Kill them. Take their heads. Chop them off. And hang them up, it says, before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. So you see, there is a place in culture and country for capital punishment. And today, today sense knowledge wise, not spiritually, but sense knowledge wise, people do more heinous crimes than this, and they get out to perform and just repeat greater crimes because there is a certain segment of political movement that thinks that they can rehabilitate man. Sometimes the only way to rehabilitate is a criminal is to remove his head and be done with it and not spend a million dollars per criminal for the rest of their life and give them a college education so that some of them, when they do get out, they turn around and sue and cost us more money. Capital punishment is godly. See, and this is what he told Moses to do. And he says, take them and hang them up before the Lord against the sun. Against the sun. Before the Lord, that phrase means to defend the honor of the true God. This is what they're doing. This is what our stance is in against it. Okay? It's not to go and to rally and champion the criminal and to say that when the criminal was four years old, his dog lifted his leg and pissed on him, and that's why he has a psychological problem that caused him to shoot 37 people. It's to champion the Lord. That's what they did. In the words against the sun, that's a mark of public dishonor. It wasn't to be done somewhere behind a tree, wasn't to be done behind a building, wasn't to be done at 3 o'clock in the morning on red-eye flight where you sneak people around the country and then the little lady from the press for the president says, oh, we weren't trying to hide anything from anybody. You know, it was done out in the open. That's what that phrase means, against the sun, as a mark of public dishonor. They dishonored God by what they were doing. They were leaders, and now they're going to be dishonored in front of everybody for what they did to God. But they were to be removed before sunset, because you didn't let it uh, body hang on a tree, or you didn't let that up. Deuteronomy 21, 23, you can read about that. So there was an end to their dishonor. Now, what do you think the Lord would do today to some of the leaders in the church for their crimes against God and against His Word? Churches who promote and accept the homosexual movement. Churches who promote and accept the woke theology, the critical race theory, and all the other garbage that the devil's trying to shove down the church's throat. And it was the leadership who Moses went to first. And you know what happened to the leadership? They lost their heads. Because they disobeyed God, they disgraced God, and they committed the act of idolatry, whoredom with false gods and, 
It all happened because they mixed in with people they shouldn't have been mixing in with. Verse 5 says, And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined in Baal Peor. He took care of the leadership. Now he said unto the judges. The judges of Israel were at this particular time the 70 elders of Israel. And the 70 elders of Israel not only oversaw the execution, but they executed the judgment. You see? They didn't sit around and delegate this responsibility out. Moses said unto them, now take care of the people who are involved in this. They got involved. They didn't sit behind a desk with a shirt and a tie and not have any blood on their hands. Do you remember in 1 Samuel chapter 15 what happened to Agag? And Agag was the king. I'll read it to you. Verse 32 says, Then Samuel said, Bring unto me hither Agag, king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel says, As thy sword has made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. He got involved. He was a servant leader. He didn't say, hey, Joe, go out and He did it himself. And that's what Moses told the 70 elders to do. He said, get off your butts and get out there and execute the judgment that I've told you to do. Verse 6. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses. Now, they were not supposed to hang out with the Midianites. And here, an Israelite has the nerve and audacity to bring this particular woman that they were instructed not to hang out with right into their presence. And to the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door at the tabernacle of the congregation. Well, they were crying. They should have been crying for their brethren and the people who were committing to whoredoms. They're crying now because they're getting reproved by a man named Moses. So this guy brings this woman right up there, right out in front of everybody. Do you know what kind of disgrace that is to do that in front of the congregation, to bring something like that, something that's unholy, something that worships another god, something that represents that, and to bring this woman, you as an Israelite, right into the presence of the congregation. He was either nuts or he had something big. Anyway, and when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and he took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly, so that the plague was stopped from the children of what? Israel. How do you like that? You learn about that in your diversity training today? We well, think woke theology would fit in with this, or CRT. But see, this was a man of God. And he recognized the sin. And you know what he did? He stood up. And not only did he stand up, he killed the Israelite and he killed the woman that the Israelite fronted. Now that might sound mean to you. But this was the day and time in which they live. Let's see what the result is. It got on the news and everybody boycotted that place and they turned against them and they send the Black Lives Matter movement out and they burned down the town of... It doesn't say that, does it? That's what would happen today. See? But in verse 9 it says, or then the verse 8, so the plague was stayed from the children of what? The plague stopped. You see? 
And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Up until that point, 24,000 people died. They would have continued to die. And they would have continued to die unless a man of God stood up and said, enough is enough, that's it. See the result of his action? Like most of the people in the church today, you know what would happen? The plague would have continued. But his allegiance and his loyalty was to God. It maybe didn't make him popular, but his allegiance and loyalty was to God. You know what he didn't do? He didn't allow the enemy in the camp. He didn't say you all need to take diversity training so we can understand how to get along with everybody because everybody's thoughts about God and how they get to heaven are equally important and as true as yours. He didn't acquiesce. He didn't compromise. He didn't let the enemy in the church at that day and time. He said, no way. This is not happening. And he took a stand. Reverend Clark Duke served as a United Methodist Church in, New in Newburg, Indiana, before he was relieved of his duties at the beginning of this December. He was not fired, according to a church official, as he did not commit any crimes or violate the United Methodist Book of Discipline. Okay, so what that means is that this guy is no longer going to be there, but he did not commit any crimes or violate the United Methodist Book of Discipline. He appeared on the HBO series, We Are Here, which is described as featuring three drag entertainers, including... Shangela, traveling to small cities across the country and their mission is to transform locals into fierce drag queens. So Duke, this minister, got this brilliant idea. And he wore a pink, what do you call that? Tear. On your hair. Wig. Hair, wig, there you go. Wig, pink. So this is, it's Carmen said about helping people earlier, and I go like this to Laura, and she don't get it. <laughs> she's a slow learner, but it's, she's faithful. I wanted a buck. Cratchit's not here. So Duke wore a pink robe while dancing and lip, lip syncing to King Ha's song, We Are Who We Are. He gets on national TV and does this, right? And this is what he says. He says he participated in the show to show his support for his daughter who identifies as pansexual, whatever that is. Do you know what a pansexual is? And this is what he said. This is a man of God, responsible for a congregation. He said it was an incredibly wonderful, refreshing, deepening. <laughs> it was an incredibly wonderful, refreshing deepening, powerful spiritual experience. Quote. Then he said, this is in an interview uh, that he gave with Religious News. It says, clearly the, fo the folks were more displeased at my participation than I was aware of. Now listen to this. Or at least the group that was unhappy continued to work together. Amen for that group. See, it wasn't the church who came up to him and said, you violated our code book. You did such and such. They didn't say beans. It was a group of elders, or it was a, a layman, or it was an elder in the church. He said, this is BS. And it was a man of renown in the church, or a woman of renown, who people knew. And they started to rally against someone within the church. The discipline, reproof, correction, should have came from where? But it didn't. Because, quote, unquote, he did not commit any crimes or violate the United Methodist Book of Discipline. It don't matter what he did against God. 
and what the Word of God says. You understand? Just as long as he stood within the boundaries of the church. And by the way, you got these PBS station defending it and saying drag queen skits for kids are good. The performing arts that can inspire creative thinking. Let me give you a literal according to usage. usage. Drag, drag queen skits for kids performing arts that can open children's minds to devil spirits so that they can be demonized and ruin their lives. That's what that means. Duke said he received a negative bullying letter, an email, an attack from a church person on November 14th that flipped the tide for him. And the guy didn't want to let go. Praise God for Phineas. He took the javelin and he ran the guy through and he ran her through. Phineas was old guard. He recognized and he defended against the attacks of the adversary. And people just don't understand that sometimes you need to put your foot down if you're going to hold the line. The whole let's lead from behind BS and turn a blind eye to sin is right from the pit of hell. You can't be a nice guy all the time because you're afraid of hurting somebody's feelings when you should be taking a stand. Jesus took a stand. He took a stand with the money changers. He took a stand with the religious leaders. Heck, he even stood against his own men. I think somewhere it says, get thee hence behind me, Satan. And he was talking to who? Peter. Peter. Well, go back to verse 7. Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, he saw it. He rose up from the congregation. He took a javelin in his hand. Verse 8, he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly so that the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 24,000. And the Lord spake unto Moses after Phineas did this. And look at what the Lord tells Moses, saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my raft away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my name's sake among them that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore, say, Behold, this is what I want you to tell him, Moses, I give unto him my covenant of what? Peace. Peace. And he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of everlasting priesthood, because he was jealous for, zealous for his God, and he made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now, whoever thought that peace could come through strength? See? Peace through strength. Psalm 29, 11, The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. With peace. Proverbs 3, verse 1, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add unto thee. That's where you get peace from. You get peace from the word of God and you get peace from being strong on the word of God. In Mark 4 verse 37, says there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full and Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow and they woke him and they said don't you care that we perish and Jesus arose he rebuked the wind and said unto the sea what peace, peace. and the wind ceased and there was a great calm peace through strength. He exercised the power of God. He stood up and he said, be calm. You understand? Mark chapter 9. I would pay you to look at this one. See, the reason we don't have peace is because people aren't strong on the word. And when you're not strong on the word, anything can enter in. 
You understand? And if you want to be friends with everybody, that doesn't fly. You got to draw the line somewhere. That doesn't mean you have to kill people and do whatever, but you got to be strong. You got to put your foot down. Because if you don't, you'll never have peace. You won't have peace in a church. You won't have peace in a relationship. You won't have peace in a country. Nine, salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, wherewith ye season it. You know what salt means here? Your words are to be salted. That means they're to be words of integrity. That means that you should say what you mean and mean what you say. And when you say something, those words are salted. It's a vow. It's a commitment. If you say you're going to do something, if you say you're going to agree to something, you know what you do? You do it. Okay? That's what that means. Now look at the rest of the verse. Have salt in yourself. Be a man. Be a woman. Have integrity. Be truthful. Be honest. If you say something, mean it. Have salt within yourself and have what? Peace with one another. See, that's why you don't have peace with one another. Because you say one thing and you do another. Or you say you're going to do this and you can't be dependent on the follow through. Or you say this and then you're out doing something stupid. Does that bring peace into a relationship? Does that bring peace into a church? Does that bring peace into a country? No. Your words are to be salted. If you're going to say something, then do it. Or you know what? Don't say it at all. Because if you say one thing and you do another, you'll never have peace in your life. And I tell you a bad thing that's going to happen. If you do it enough times, you're going to get a reputation. And if you get a reputation, people aren't going to come to you and share anything with you or believe you. Because if the dog bites you enough times and the sign says friendly dog, sooner or later you're going to figure it out. Right? And if you get a bad reputation, that stays with you for a lifetime. It's very difficult to change a bad reputation. Okay? Say, for instance, you're a fox or a wolf. Now, you can't blame the wolf for breaking into the chicken coop. That's what wolves do. <laughs> In defense of any self respecting wolf. So, if the wolf gets caught and says, I promise I'm not going to do this to you anymore. And he keeps doing it. Are you ever going to believe that wolf? How about the boy that said the sky's falling in? Who was that, Chicken Little? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sky's falling in, the sky's falling in, the sky's falling in. Or the boy that cried wolf. Said it once, said it twice, said it three times, said it four times. The fourth time there was a real wolf there, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody listened to him no more, right? Why? Because he had a reputation of not being a boy that had integrity. So you don't want to do that. Everybody makes mistakes. Poop happens. Things happen. All you got to do is pick up a phone, send a text, do whatever. But your words should mean something. Your words should be salted. When your words are salted, you'll have peace in your relationship. You'll have peace among yourselves. Luke 11, verse 21. When a strong man armed, keepeth his palace, his goods are in what? Peace. Okay? Taking guns away from American citizens because they're evil is absolutely contrary to the Bible. And you're going to accomplish peace that way? The Bible says when a strong man with multiple arms, I added the multiple, automatic weapons, keeps his palace, what happens? His goods are in peace. That's peace through strength. You understand? That's how it works. Then they give you the whole love story, you know, how we should love everybody. Yeah, God's love, but God doesn't like sin. 
And he doesn't like people who want to sanitize sin and promote it as something else. The God who is love is also the God who is described in Romans 16.20. Let me tell you about the God who is love that is described in Romans 16.20. And the God of peace, the God of peace shall crush Satan's head, one translation. Shall bruise Satan, shall smash his face into the ground under your feet, surely. That's peace through strength. You see? You all know that Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Colossians chapter 1, two more scriptures here. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace, how did he make peace? Through, Through the blood, blood of the what? His cross. See? You've got to be a strong person to go through what Jesus Christ went through. Anybody want to disagree with that? Peace through strength. Peace through his blood. He was willing to give his life. He was willing to be a man of integrity. He was willing to stay and not move so that we could have peace. And by him all things are reconciled unto himself, whether it's in heaven or in earth. And you who are sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled you. And we close in Psalm chapter 2. You don't recognize the Taliban as a new people and country, and now we're going to work diplomatically with them and have peace in that sector of the world. That is BS lie garbage. We trust them. We trust that they're going to do what they say and that they're going to be men and women of their word. Yeah, right. We need a couple more Phineases around. Psalm 2. This is talking about, in the book of Revelation, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes bound to set things straight, when the Prince of Peace comes. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, the Christos. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. That's what God's going to do. He's going to laugh at them. And the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill Zion and I will declare a decree. And the Lord said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy what? Possession. Possession. That's what's going to happen. God's going to give it to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, is going to do to establish his peaceful reign on the earth during the Millennial Kingdom. Thou shalt break them with a rod. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And here's God's warning to the people on earth. Be wise now therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, with rejoice and trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you shall perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they, that all they that put their trust in what? Yeah. See? The Prince of Peace will establish his peaceful reign on earth through strength. Okay? If you want peace in your life, yes, God gives you spiritual peace. If you want peace in your life, if you want peace in your home, if you want peace in your relationship, you have to have strength. You have to have integrity, okay? And that's how you will have peace. I didn't tell you that you won't have trouble, and I didn't tell you that the adversary won't challenge that. But giving in, compromising, changing things, milking it down, 
watering it down will never get you true peace. True peace comes from true strength. And there's nobody stronger in the world than Jesus Christ. That's why he has a title, he's the Prince of Peace. So I would exhort you to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you say something, mean it. And the result of that is that you will have peace. The result of Phineas's strong stand on the word was that he was given a covenant of peace. It even went on to the next generation, an everlasting priesthood. That's pretty good, right? Let's pray. Amen. Father, thanks for your word, your goodness, and that we could be strong men and women because that's what you made us be in Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Don't forget to click that like button and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And remember, if we are shut down for some type of censorship reason, you can always check out our videos at www.cvm.church. Thank you for your patronage. This was brought to you by Chapter and Verse Ministry. Like Jacob, who prayed to the God of Abraham, deliver my life. I'm not worthy of the least of all thy mercies. Deliver my life. As for me, I will call.